Castaigne. I'm the Clinical Director of the Behavioral Emergency Response Team. I've got Marisol Romero here, who is our, um, our BERT lead, um, definitely you see around in the daytime, and then Sasha is here, and she is one of our practicum students who will be going off and uh, uh, to Arkansas yes. soon. Uh, to do her pre-doc. Um, so they also wanted to come in and they'll just, um, if they have anything to add, they will. I have a child care challenges this afternoon, so I will try to be quick and prompt and to the point because I won't have any room to stay after. But hopefully I'm around. I'm actually going to be back on at 9 tonight, so if you have questions, <laughs> you please come find me. I've got a meeting with Audie at 10. It all works out good. Um, so, uh, and I will be on... Um, uh, to, what's today, Thursday? I'll be on tomorrow night and Friday night. So you'll probably see me. I kind of hope you don't because it means there aren't any birds. There used to be a day. The, we used to have a day. I mean, I remember the days when we didn't have birds and it doesn't feel that way anymore. It feels like this is just like nonstop, all the time birds. So um, I wanted to review the bird criteria, look at our roles, look at some patient de-escalation, look at our outliers, and then do a couple of case examples. Really open for questions um, uh, and discussions. I don't have, I mean, this is gonna obviously be a multidisciplinary response and approach, and um, I think that our, um, our teams are working really well together, but um, what do we need to do? What next steps do we need to take? Because it doesn't feel like it's stopping. It doesn't feel like it's slowing down. The way we used to have those times where we would have busy seasons and then quiet seasons and then busy seasons. And now it's busy season, really busy season, busy season, <laughs> really busy season. Um, so the, um, the, those times are few and far between. So I think we have to look at how we're managing the patients. Um, I wanted to give a brief overview. Stacy probably has some of this history more than I do. Um, um, so in 2001, Alameda County and Children's um, uh, developed an initiative, a contract basically, which designated Children's Hospital as the receiving psychiatric court for Alameda County's children under the age of 11. And so we hear a lot of, but they're, they're over 12. It's really under 12. Under 12, excuse me. I was wishing. I was dreaming. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I, 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 that would be great. But uh, um, although the age of 11 is actually nice because we can get placement. Mm -hmm. At 11, it becomes a lot harder under 11. That's a challenge. So um, the estimated volume of um, children is approximately about 150 kids annually. Just so you know, I'm not sure what our year to date is, but last year I had 480. Um, and so if you're thinking about the resources that they were putting in back then and the resources that they're putting in now, there have been some changes, but the volume is just sort of skyrocketed. Um, the expected patient stay was always under eight hours. Um, and now there's a lot. <laughs> I wish it was under eight hours. I think that um, that we are seeing more and more um, birds that are being here um, past that 24-hour mark. Um, just so you know, I, I feel like I've, I've known many of you for quite a while. I started my postdoc when it, it was in 2008, and then I became the bird coordinator in 2009. And um, and I feel like I didn't. I, every now and then we get a kid that would stay like. 24 hours. Every now and then, like once in a blue moon, like hardly once a year would we get a birth that was here for the, the duration of the 72 hour hold. And now it feels like it is happening on a very regular basis. 24 hours is nothing to us at this point. Um, and the, the, I, I'm, I'm sure we've had um, you know, at least six kids stay um, over 72 hours since January. Um, which, so it, it's uh, changed a lot. I have the same issue at Mission Head. Right. Yeah, I know. Two weeks. Yeah. Two weeks. Yeah. Thirty and days. And maybe you'll touch on this later, yeah. but is the overall volume statewide greater, which then puts a greater impact on the receiving facilities, and that's why they're with us? I longer? will bring that up. Okay. So um, um, I'll probably bring that up in a few slides about why that is. I just think it's good to have some historical context. Yeah. Text. It's not just us that are imagining that we're feeling oversaturated by this. This is happening at um, hospitals, not just children's hospitals, but hospitals across the state of California. Um, and there are some very specific reasons why it's happening. So we, I think we're fortunate to have the county contract. Um, um, some of you know me um, pretty well personally. My husband's an emergency department nurse. 
uh, and he used to work down in Washington, and now he's over at Kaiser. And our days at times um, before he left Washington, they were like really parallel. Like what nursing is doing at some other hospitals. I mean, there's so much psych stuff that you guys end up doing um, that it um, is always very eye-opening to me. I was like, I was doing that too. I was restraining a kid. I was doing that too. You know, so we have these uh, <laughs> these uh, these great bedtime conversations. <laughs> Come and talk. Um, so. Um, Burr patients were never left unattended, so if you remember the time when we actually had somebody that was there like 24 hours, sleeping overnight, right? Like there would be a social worker that was in the um, in the family room that was sleeping while the Burt was in you know bed 14 sleeping. So that has that stopped. I think maybe in about 2010 or 11 or so, um, with um, with Stacy support and, and Mary Rutherford as well. And so really, our purpose at the time when it was designed was to assess and dispo. So it was always assessed and we had two places to go. We were safety planning, we were um, sending to a hospital. So this whole sort of intermittent intervention piece was not really part of um, what we had formulated, which is why I think we've seen some um, sometimes inconsistent for certain, even what you've probably experienced as inconsistent responses to after hours for clinicians is because they had this idea and they have a really hard time changing the track between safety plan and dispo versus like this kid is staying for 24 hours or 48 hours and they're needing other things to be able to um, to manage their behavior in the emergency department. So what changes have been made to our service model? So in 2014, and this is one of the biggest ones, mobile response team, Alameda County's mobile response team closed. So mobile response team used to go out into the homes and to respond to a crisis that's occurring and then um, they would also uh, go out into the homes to respond uh, uh, to a child who is being um, relief, released from either an inpatient psychiatric facility or from us. Um, they would go like the day of discharge, they would go like the next day. Families could call them up when they would go into crisis and um, and then they would respond and they were they were almost a 24 hour a day service and what was happening from like 2000 to 2012 and then 2014 is their service hours were going down and down and down and finally they just weren't able to financially sustain the program and so it completely closed. So one thing that you probably have experienced is these kids that are staying longer sometimes is because we don't have services to set them up with at least not the level of it, for the level of acuity that they're, they're experiencing. Um, and, um, and also, they were sort of like that first response, responder um, to a behavioral crisis. So oftentimes they would go out with like open PD, um, they would uh, respond to these behavioral crises and try to contain them in the home. So that's gone, so we feel that. That's one of the things that we feel as a county. Um, in 2014, Alameda County Behavioral Health Leadership actually changed and they tried to become more aligned with the ACA, um, which was, which was good, but in doing so, they what they realized is that the way they set BERT up is that we were set up to be a crisis therapy service, but we're not crisis therapy. Um, but we really should be crisis stabilization, but we don't have the distinction of the stabilization because that requires a certain nursing, psychiatrist, staffing ratio that we can't provide, we're not able to do. Um, but it changes what we can do in minute to minute and hour to hour. So we're able to sort of recruit for the direct service that we do and not the indirect service that we do, What's which is ACA? tough. Uh, the Affordable Care Act. Oh. Oh. Uh -huh. Sorry. We're good with that, that acronym. So the big one um, where we're seeing that we, we, are, we the, our volume doubled really at the loss of AB 3632. So AB 3632 was legislation that basically gave the rights to, Al, to a county to make um, behavioral health decisions and interventions on a particular child. And what they would do is they'd say, okay, this child needs a higher level of care, they need to go into a residential facility, they need to go into a group home, and we are going to sort of funnel the money and then make sure that they get that. Um, what they did when they lost AB 3632 is, they said, we now want the school districts to pick up the, um, the responsibility of assessing and determining if a child is 
um, going to need a higher level of care since it impacts their education. And so if you look at a place like Oakland or Oakland Unified School District, which does not have any resources to spare, we started to see the amount of kids that are in residential care dropping, just completely plummeting. So it's a it's a it's a system of care issue where we have we're getting kids who are basically not at the right level of service intervention, and the people that are sort of the purse string holders are the school districts. So we're gonna we're gonna uh, talk about um, at the uh, towards the end when we're looking at our case um, um, descriptions um, and with a patient that we had here um, who was here last. September for 16 days because he falls into this category. Where are you saying? That, sorry, are you saying that the school isn't providing the referrals that they should be, and so incorrect. so then they aren't getting the help early enough, right. and then we see them in crisis? Right. Not every right. school has the qualified personnel to yeah. so assess that. Okay. They don't have the qualified personnel to do it, but more than anything, they just—I mean—it all comes back down to having the resources and the money to be able to do it. Um, but I think that we're looking at schools who have such limited mental health services, and then they're engaging with law enforcement to come in, and then obviously, as we know, that oftentimes escalates the number of our patients, um, and so it just sort of, it, it snowballs, and we're feeling the direct result of that snowball. Um, so um, we're looking, I, I could pull my numbers from like 2014 to right now, and it's just been a, like a steady increase from that point that we lost that. So, forgive me for asking this, the residential care facilities still have beds. It's just not getting filled. No, because so they're not getting the right all calls. of these residential care facilities in the state of California shut down. Mm -hmm. They just oh, shut yeah. down. They don't exist yeah. because they lost. They're how are they going to get their money? How are they going to get their money? Is the school district going to pay? Right, because the school district didn't. didn't and, isn't it? and I want to be very mindful of like, do they, do they do they do they want to or do they have the resources to pay for these things? I mean, I think that um, um, it was it was a very immature. That's my bias, but it was a very immature legislative move because I, their focus was. Um, um, the county is doing all of this sort of out of placement and the goal sort of it's like the least restrictive idea of like let's keep them in the home let's keep them in their natural environment but the schools can't support that so our number one referral source is obviously the schools and through the long through police departments right that's how most of our kids come in are they doing anything to fix that lot of, of they have something called ERMS, so anybody that has a child in special education, there are certain um, assessments that they, that they go through. It's just much, much, much harder. Um, and there's some, there's some quantitative studies that are looking at the, um, the, the, the loss of uh, um, the county being able to do that. Where it impacts us is that our number one sort of champion is, um, is Alameda County Behavioral Health. So I can call our director on my cell phone to his cell phone and I can I can text him and I can email him and he's very responsive but now we're talking about a completely different system of care that we're not so involved in so that's where um, when we tend to have kids that are here for an extended period of time is it that we can't get them placement or is it that they're not um, they're not able to um, get into the right level of care and that's why we're seeing an increase in our, our high utilizers of, of the services um, the other thing that happened, and this goes back to the 2014 change and aligning with the ACAs, we used to have postdoc fellows on Monday through Friday that were performing um, performing um, for, for clinical services. Mona was the last of the postdoc fellows who we hired on, um, but we needed to move away from having postdocs to actually having licensed clinicians, which makes complete sense because um, we're taking some of the most uh, fragile kids in our county, and then to have somebody with uh, less education isn't necessarily what we would want. We want people who have the experience to be able to de-escalate and to be able to manage. So with that shift, it came the hiring of Pam and Peter and then now Maddie Saul. So, uh, and this is Peter Bennings. But you would think that if, since we're in uh, <laughs> we seem to be in desperate measures, why aren't we utilizing that postdoc person? We don't have the postdoc mm -hmm. fellowship anymore. I know. Yeah. Uh, but you would think that we would in such yeah. desperate measures. Yeah. yeah. I, I yeah. I, I agree. I, it was a choice of like where are we going to spend our money. But sure. yes, we're you know absolutely. 
Um, the last piece, too, is that we're no longer using the medical social work pool for after-hours calls. So we've become sort of this all-in-one, like, BERT program. Um, it's had some limited uh, limitations. It's probably why I'm working the line a lot more. Um, but I think that the medical social work was getting spread so, so thin um, and um, with some varying level of experience. And then I think we had different, um, um, different perspectives about what actual clinical interventions should be um, and how do we support. Um, so the idea of like, I'm going to step in, I'm going to do the assessment, and then I'm going to get out because there's no beds versus I'm going to get in, I'm going to do whatever assessment I can and then do some intervention as well. So that was a shift that, um, that was challenging for people to make. So Marcia and I both decided um, a very uh, collegially and supportively that it was better to split the program. So those are just changes that I think are important to make. Um, so um, who does what? This is something that um, I will spend a lot more time talking about um, uh, in the future. This is something that um, I think we're going to have to educate everybody in the hospital on, um, which is really distinguishing what is constituting as what would be a medical social work consult versus what is BERT. Um, although BERT is psych, we can't respond to all of the needs, and it's probably not a good, when we open up a BERT assessment, automatically it's three hours, minimum three hours to get somebody um, completely assessed and out the door. And so, um, but a medical social work consult could be done in, you know, 30 to 45 minutes. So sometimes it is appropriate for it to be a medical social work um, consult as opposed to a BERT or a psych consult. So this is our list. Um, I, I know that um, I haven't shared this with, um, with Stacy and, um, and Teresa yet, um, so it's all somewhat new. Some of it comes down to history um, and what the stresses are going on versus more sort of active, active um, um, self-injury, active suicidality. Because what was happening is we were getting these birds that were, <coughs> you know, they have this history of cutting. How long ago were they cutting? They were cutting six weeks ago. You know, are they in an active <coughs> state of crisis or do we just need to make sure that they're getting the services that they need? Um, which is what we would um, want to do, um, just so that we can expedite them out of the emergency department. Um, so um, this is, like I said, this is our list. I won't go through everything just for the sake of time, but we'll, um, we'll circle back to it um, um, at, later on. I'd like to spend time on this, not today. So then we're looking at the roles of the BERT clinician, um, and actually for everybody. Um, and this is, you know, I think open for discussion. This is sort of how we conceptualize what everybody's roles are, if this feels appropriate. Um, I'm also open to making revisions of what the roles are. We see ourselves as being responsible for the assessment, providing the crisis de-escalation, <laughs> providing stabilization and intervention. We need to find the hospital beds. Um, we're, you know, hopefully in close contact with um, nursing and with the medical team, and then we determine dispo, and we'll really see ourselves as being consultants um, of the emergency department. Um, we're co technically a consulting service. I think that that is um, a little bit different in the emergency department because I think we um, have become increasingly embedded in the ED. Um, <laughs> You guys have tolerated us to sort of take over the back, um, and um, but I think it's really what's needed to be able to provide the care and the stabilization for our patients. Um, so um, we are we are uh, we we are staking um, st staking some 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 land here. Um, nursing, looking at triage, vitals in the labs, food ordering, restraint management, basic hygiene, toileting, and overall patient care. Residents to complete the HEADS assessment. We really want the residents to complete the HEADS assessment. I think that that's probably one of our concerns is that when they don't complete it, there's that that's where some of the good history comes out. Um, not to say that they don't have other things and other patients to see, but um, but when a chief complaint is just sort of like this patient has been difficult and then that like and then they skip over like it just sort of gets activated as a bird very early and then they they skip out whereas like if they had stepped in they might be able to um, appropriately triage if um, if it would if it could, could you talk about that, the head SS, H E A D S S what is that? The HEADS assessment? Yeah. Um, it's the psychosocial assessment for um, that, that residents learn. The SS is suicidality and, I want to say it's sadness? Se 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 sexuality. Sexual, sorry, sexuality. Sexual activity. And so these are just all of the questions that they're asking. Why does that do that? What's the acronym stand for? Uh, I think it's like the home, the, the yeah. environment, education. Uh, the A is for. D is for drugs, and the A is for everybody. No, education, there's one more thing. I don't know. 
is for drugs, sexuality, suicide, family, and then home. Home and at home. E is education, employment. A is activities. Activity. D is drugs. S is sexuality, and S is suicide or depression. So residents are supposed to be doing this. They do it in primary care, and then I think they come over to the emergency department, and sometimes it gets lost because we're here, and they're like, oh, it's a bird, just make it a bird. Um, and um, sometimes it's appropriate, and sometimes it's not. So we're working with the medical team to, to sort of hone in and focus on that a little bit more. Um, Determining organic causes of behavior in cases of psychosis, ordering and managing medication. I think that that's a challenging one, especially since we don't, it doesn't seem like they, um, you know, when we have these extended verts, how does the management of medication happen when they're here for several days? Security. So this is my belief, is that security's role is to supervise the patient, to notify nursing and vert clinician if patient engages in unsafe or disruptive behavior, assisted with holding patient down if restraints are required. So those are, that's my belief of what security should do. It gets really tricky because when you have somebody here for an extended period of time and there's a security guard that's going to play Connect Four with the patient, I don't necessarily mind it. However, I think there's issues of secondary gain that come up. I think that there's issues of boundaries that come up. And we obviously are having security engage in, um, in patient care. And, I, I, and that's like there's something there's this interaction that's occurring that I think sometimes becomes um, very very kind of <laughs> we can go down the list and down the list and down the list um, and um, you know as I was talking to to Linda yesterday about this I feel like um, you know we're asking security to with you know such little uh, training to be able to sort of manage these incredibly acute patients at times, and it's just a gentle snatch. Do you have the PCA on here now? I just see I do not. It's in the little wall. I like that one. It's in the wall. So we can flesh that out because I think that that was obviously an incredibly helpful the sitter. intervention um, in our last case that we had for uh, this extended birth. And then the attending to provide medic medical needs and medication consultation with the psychiatrist. And then to, I, I feel like I deleted the last of this sentence. I felt like it was like to be as engaged as they feel what's necessary to be. And I think that that's a huge and broad statement because it's very difficult to find it to be attending to some issues that you can figure out. Um, so, and when we're looking at patient de-escalation, patients should have one-on-one -on -one security per the hospital protocol, and patients should always have one-on-one -on -one security for the hospital protocol. So not just when it's issues around de-escalation, but that is our standard of care. Um, patients should be removed to room 13 only if patient presents with active behaviors that would indicate harm to self or harm to others and is not responsive to redirection or if environmental stimuli is overwhelming. So sometimes we have kids that are on the spectrum or are, um, uh, are uh, have, have uh, sensory integration issues and it might be appropriate to go over to room 13. Um, if there is one BERT patient, um, room assignments should be managed so that agitated BERTs aren't able to communicate. I should say that agitated BERTs, any BERTs shouldn't be able to communicate. Um, we're not trying to create or recreate a milieu environment. We're trying to isolate um, isolate them. Uh, that sounds like a bad word, but we're trying to sort of keep their care managed specifically for what their needs are. I think you mean they're not supposed to communicate with one another. Yes. Not unable to communicate. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Stacey. <laughs> duct tape. Yes. No duct tape. Please don't use duct tape. They should not be communicating, so they're not able to communicate with each other. Um, so those four in the hallway. Like the four in the hallway. Uh, no, because that's making a plan. That was awful. I know that was bad. Yeah. That was that was a <laughs> that got worse. bad situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Um, Linda has informed me of, of of that all that went down that Friday. The riots. <laughs> felt like. Um, right. Anyway, so um, look, just looking at room assignments as much as possible. And I think that they're probably coming up to the end of that very lengthy stay for the BERT patient that we had to, um, uh, to I, don't, I, I don't think that their security was adequately matched in the way that they are And I do think that that's a change in our mentality, is that we need to be using like room 6 and room 14 and room 19. We need to be spreading them out after this you know, previously at the request we used, uh, security's request we used 11, 12, 8, and 9. And then they were all there for extended periods, you know, it was greater than 12 hours, 14 hours, and by the, at 10 o'clock at night it just was an explosive situation. Right, right. And, and we're, that's a change because our mentality is to accommodate um, security. 
Right, and which is so interesting because we are accommodating security, we need them so much, and are we, do we need to be accommodating security or do we need to be managing these patients? And like, how, do, how are we deviating away from patient care in those moments? And what do we do if we have five patients and three security guards? Or what, like, what do they do? Do they call in reinforcements? Or? Yeah, we've yeah. talked about that. The rule is the rule. Yeah, that's one, but one observation while they're in the bird stats. We have talked about once they're released from bird and waiting for dispo to home and you already have your plan and all that stuff the way we talked about releasing security earlier is when a plan is made and you're just waiting for mom or whatever right or mom's in the room that and we don't expect well. them to be an, a, a behavioral problem, right? right? I mean, because we can have kids who aren't going to meet criteria and are going to be hyperactive and are going to be bouncing around and are going to be wandering around. And so maybe it's appropriate to keep security there for the duration till, till the nurse comes and discharges them. But for the most part, we would, you know, we're, we're trying to move to sort of alleviate some of securities um, because they're, they're spread thin. They are. Yeah. Um, but we are talking about two different things in that, yes, we hear what you're saying. So they've made a safety plan and there's an hour lag. But we are still accommodating security by putting birds together because they yeah, do we not, are not doing that. It, because I we do not have one to one we, coverage. We are one to one coverage. I will never tell you to change yeah. that. You can pay to me a hundred times. And no, no, say, but that's what. But I do think, it. But that's what we all. That's the mindset of what I'm hoping people will take away. Exactly right. The rule is the rule. The rule is the rule. And and after this, ex, you know experience that I have, we just even need to be more purposeful about separating. Mm -hmm. I agree with because you. Because when they're going to be there 16 hours, they can't help. If you just had four families in a room for, for 16 hours, they would begin to talk to each other. Yeah. Just because they have to sit there with their room open for 16 hours. Yeah. What can't I help but do that. If you were to go for anybody who's ever been to Willow Rock, which is a really good experience, and if anybody has any interest in doing that, um, we usually go on a tour once a year. Um, it's really helpful to see. When they go into Real Rock, the crisis stabilization unit, um, they it's a really nice facility. Um, it's uh, like I described Little Rock as like nicer than my first like apartment. It's mm -hmm. just sort of like the, it was a time when the county had more money and they sort of set up this. It's not. It doesn't feel inpatient like at all. Mm -hmm. It's um. It's it's <coughs> like a it's like a double treat in sort mm -hmm. of how it feels. And um, and they're all in separate rooms. So that's not the time that they're like. Even though there's some common areas, they're not hanging out together. That's not the intention of it. The intention of it is for their for them to be able to sort of regulate their own emotional responses and then to um, have some individual sort of processing time. Um, and so if we took their model, we think about it here, the time it isn't for them to, you know, to engage with each other, obviously, that's not, that's going to get them worked up. We're trying to de-escalate. So that's part of what supports that, that line of thinking as well. What's the bed capacity of Hill and Rock? Um, the crisis stabilization unit, I believe, is eight. The inpatient is somewhere, I think, between 10 and 12 beds. Mm -hmm. So crisis right. stabilization unit is um, um, under 24 hours. So when kids come there, they will come into Willow Rock um, and they will, if they come straight to Willow Rock, like on a hold, because there's no medical needs, there's no any of the issues that we know that they end up coming here for, um, they will come straight to the crisis stabilization unit, and then if they meet criteria, they will go over to the inpatient psych facility, which is telecare. And so they're right next to each other, although they technically they're separate buildings. But there's no common mixing area or anything. They're two very separate patient populations that are occurring. Um, when they, when, what we run into problems with, and we, this is a frequent complaint with Willow Rock, is that Willow Rock crisis stabilization unit, those little eight beds that they can, not even beds, they don't have beds, they have like couches and, you know, kind of comfort, comfortable places to hang out, but not, um, no beds. Um, they won't take a patient unless there is room in their inpatient psych facility. So they could have room in their crisis stabilization unit, but it's very difficult for me to say, I really just want you to assess this child. Please take them in your crisis stabilization unit. And I'll say, well, but they could need inpatient psych, in which case we're not able to accept anybody. But you have space in your crisis stabilization unit, don't you? Yes, we do, but we don't have paid room in the inpatient psych. So that's what we run into on a very regular basis. Even though they're paid by the county to be the assessment center for 12 years or older than 12. Because they can't hold people in the crisis stabilization unit. 
They choose not to. But they can discharge them from there. But they, they can discharge them. Which action. is why it isn't a one-to-one -one enter enter. Right. This one could argue then when that one goes out, that one goes out. Right. You know. Right. Agreed. I agree. But that's their, their way they run it. That's the way they run it. And I think that um, um, they're, uh, you know, the county loves them. They, uh, they, um, they don't see um, sending a patient over here for medical, um, medical clearance or medical stabilization as, um, as a, as being on diversion, right? They just see it as like, oh, they just, they were coughing. <laughs> they need to come to a, 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 a hospital. For a <laughs> so I don't want to get too lost in that process. What though, is so. our process? So for the kids under 12 or 11, we would admit them straight to the inpatient because you're the assessment mm -hmm. people. Correct. And then the kids over 12 have to go to the crisis stabilization unit. So that's wish. a really good question. Um, that is how we used to run things, and then about probably about maybe 2013 or 2014, I was like, this is ridiculous. And so I talked to the county about if we're waiting on Willow Rock, like that's not working. We would just like to be able to direct admit if we need to. Um, um, so we do oftentimes send it over to Willow Rock and say, and they'll say, well, um, would you like some help? with placement and we'll say, sure, but they're not really, they're not a big priority for them because they're here. And so oftentimes we'll say, and we'll continue to find a bed also, <laughs> which is what we do. We'll, like, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be reaching out because we know that um, they will prioritize who's coming in and then they've got a rig coming in and so, oh, it bumps that person because now there's somebody live that's there with them and so we don't like to lose our place in line. So we we are pretty aggressive with trying to contact in, in, in patients like facilities. So no, we no longer do and actually, and previously we hadn't been sort of billing the county for kids that are over the age of 12 and that's gone. That rule is gone. We're like, forget it, we're billing because we're, we're, we're holding kids we're assessing them, we need to bill for them. So we pretty much bill for most of our kids. We don't have good, um, the hospital has never negotiated mental health rates effectively. So when we have like a commercial pay insurance kid that comes through, we, you know, we get like $40 for the assessment. So it's very not sustainable for us. But, um, but we are the county court and the county does pay fairly well. And just to clarify, the problem is, is that when they're over 12 and we've medically cleared them, and you call over to Willow Rock, they do not take them back because in their minds, if they don't have a bed for them to be placed, then they can't just go to the assessment center because they're concerned that they might need a bed. And that's what leaves over 12 here for a prolonged period of time because now we have to find them or... Or wait for Willow Rock too. Right. Yes. And and we have, it's easier, quicker, for potentially us to find them in the patient bed. Yes. Hmm. So it's all a very complicated system. I know people don't need to know a ton about it, but that's just, I, I do think it's good to have a little bit of background understand. why why some of this um, um, it happens longer than, than necessary. I did want to spend a little bit of time um, um, to make this not just informational, but a little bit educational when we're looking at um, what, um, when births, you know, when births really become behavioral emergencies, I feel like most of our kids aren't coming in activated. They're not coming in that are going to harm themselves in the moment in the room, right? I mean, they're sort of they're sort of calmer. Um, I mean, even kids that are coming in and we hear that they're in a two or four point restraint. Oftentimes, by the time they get here, we're able to like take those restraints off, and the transfer can happen quite smoothly. Um, but wanting to look at more so about what are we doing when a patient is actually active, actively self-injuring, actively suicidal. Um, some of this is protocols that we look at um, when patients become inpatient births on the floors. Um, so when they're actively endorsing suicidal. And so some of the things that we're seeing is a shift in motor agitation and then also a significant shift in mood. So those are the two big markers that we're looking for. Um, and we believe patients should be re you know, removed and placed into 13. So wherever they are, they should probably be moved if they're not if they're <coughs> actively injured. And I, I've seen this, you know, and it oftentimes can feel like it's like they're, they're trying to demonstrate a level of, of distress. But like, how much are we going to allow for this? To, you know, this is, you and I talked mm -hmm. about this, you know, uh, yesterday. Or um, really blowing at their skin is usually what happens. Um, that uh, when they need to go over it to. Um, to Can one of the team. day shift nurses come to the court, please? Um, 
So um, staff should be giving the same consistent message, and by staff I mean all of us, you know, nursing, BERT, security, um, directive messages about the behaviors. Um, the message of like, we are doing the X, Y, and Z to keep you safe is an important message I think that um, we need to be saying. Reflecting and validating the statements, um, validating statements. So I know that how you're feeling, that you're feeling bad right now, this is gonna pass. Um, um, I know you're hurting, it's gonna be okay. Um, those types of statements, which um, um, I, I sometimes I hear, and probably more, more often from security, but like, it's not so bad. Um, those things, those types of things that are sort of de uh, invalidating, de de diminishing the experience is what we want to uh, stay away from. Their feelings are their feelings, and it, they may have um, very specific reasons of why they're in distress. Um, giving options about medications, um, either injections or orals, and then no threats and avoiding power struggles. And I think that this is the hardest one to do because um, I, it's so hard to say. Um, in that sort of loving, kind voice of like, you know, of a kid who's who's actively fighting you or is going to be spitting on you to say, I, you know, I'd like you to take this medication. I'd like you to take this, you know, Zytus in your tongue. It'll dissolve in your mouth. Or I can give you an injection. Which would you like? You know, take this. But really trying to avoid the power struggles if at all possible. Um, and no threats. I think that that threats thing is um, what can oftentimes happen um, in, in regards to group 13. If, if you don't, and like I, you can say the same things of like if you're not able to behave yourself, or you're not able to contain yourself, or if you continue to hit that wall, I'm going to have to put you into this room versus knock it off, or you know, that's that that's that bad room, um, and we shouldn't be using room 13 as a punishment, but really as a way to contain their behaviors um, and to keep them safe. It's an awful room to be in, but it does help and stay safe. Um, active aggression, active aggression and de-escalation. So when patients enduring, endorsing increased aggression, clear limits should be set. Um, and so, like the way you're acting isn't okay. You need to stop. Um, recognizing the difference between hyperactivity and aggression. I think this is what security struggles with a lot of the times um, because they're bouncing off the walls in um, for probably a very typical ADHD way um, versus aggression that may be underlying. There may be underlying trauma, and a lot of our kids obviously have some um, pretty significant trauma that they've experienced. If a patient remains safe, once again, we're avoiding a power struggle. Um, continue to make clear directive statements with intentions and options. So um, you're like you're being unsafe. We're going to walk over to that, you know, to the quiet room. We're going to give you some medication. You know, do you want it by mouth? Do you want it a shot? Um, and then we can go back to the regular room and you're calm. Um, validating the emotions. I know that this is scary. Um, I know that you're mad right now. Explaining your role. You know, we're going to take you out of restraints when you're feeling better. It's my job to keep you safe. Um, and then distraction is your friend. So a lot of our kids, I, I can don't I'm taping this, but I, I feel like over the summer we had this kid who um, was really out of control and he was this little guy in in um, in 13 and his biggest disruption was Pokemon. Do you remember that? Pokemon. Like and and he was the very last kid that Peter had seen and Peter had you know done like the mic drop like at the end of his shift and he um, he had told me all about it and then he um, and then when this kid came back in, and I didn't know who it was, and finally it clicked to me, like, this is that Pokemon kid. And so I was just like, so do you like, I mean, he's screaming and going crazy in room 13 and ready to, like, claw into the security's eyeballs. And I was like, do you like Pokemon? And he's like, I love Pokemon. And it, <laughs> that was it. It completely was like a distraction technique that it, that that was successful. We ended up needing to um, to restrain him, but like I tried every distraction technique, and that's really our role, right? To try as many distraction techniques as possible to be able to help calm them down, or at least keep them safe, so that we can um, get medication in them as quickly as possible, and then get them out of restraints as fast as possible. Um, and then active psychosis. So I'm sure you know this. Early psychosis occurs between the ages of 13 and 18 in males, 17 and 21 in females. Um, if a patient demonstrates positive or negative symptoms, um, you want to engage in following interventions. One, asking about their experiences, bringing them to person, place, time, um, which you may need to do on a regular basis. Um, and then I think it's really helpful to ask a person to focus on an activity. The, um, the pictures that Stacy has, can be really good. Those, those wall finding pictures are really good um, distractions. Um, I, I um, years ago made the mistake of like having the same thought as you, but using like a Waldo type thing, and it was just too much visual. So it was a bad idea. Um, so, but those are very 
they're very um, appropriate because the, the, they're not too complex and um, they're not too simple and uh, it's it's the amount of, amount of stimuli that seems to be just right for kids. What do you mean by asking about their experiences? Like what do you like? What do you? Uh, do you like to it, no, I, actually, I would say more so about um, what they're experiencing in the moment oh, in the right. room, oh, okay. so that part of that like. Like especially if somebody's got worried, if, like they're having paranoid thoughts that are occurring, um, um, just to give you a little bit more information about how you're wanting to engage with them. Um, if they are having any active um, hallucinations um, or delusions, I feel like we have a lot of kids who sort of report voices, and that's not the same things as those kids that are coming in that we're like, wow, there's really something organically wrong with them, and you can tell. Um, and we want to try to help to stabilize them. So it's just to give you a little bit more information about how they're doing. So are you, so all the kids that we get are like the, the seven, eight, and nine-year-olds that are just behaving badly at school. I feel like the schools are just frustrated and turfing them off to us, and not even, I don't know what they're supposed to do with them, but all those kids are Clearly not, or they don't not do that. They don't appear to be organically, psychologically right. ill. Right. So, what are we doing with these kids? We know they're probably they're too young for the psychotic breaks, and they're just being bratty. So, what do you do with those? I mean, are those then not the birds? Then those are the, the social workers? No, I don't think that that's true. I mean, one, if any kid comes in on hold, they're on hold, right? So we own okay. them if they come on a hold without a doubt, they're, okay. they're ours to do. So I don't wanna, I, okay. I, I wanna differentiate between the expectation. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I would say that um, a number of our kids, once we get down to some history, usually have some pretty complex trauma. Um, and so you see these sort of reactive um, responses to the trauma. Um, and a lot of it appears to be pretty fear-based. Um, once we get in there and begin to do the assessments. I still think that there's like the very basics of like, this is the limits that we're setting. You know, this is this is what your expectations are. I didn't make a slide for this, but like, here's what's happening in the EED. Here's what I'm here to do. So so the repeat offenders are the ones who keep coming in at each time say, we need, if they, we know that they've been here before, well, we can say that, well, things have changed a little bit since you were here last time. This is what are, we're expecting this time. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I would say um, that we would be expecting for um, for high utilizers um, that there is um, much more of a structure to be developed by us mm -hmm. um, in terms of when and so and the reason why we're not standardizing it as much is because sometimes we get kids who um, if they're more on the spectrum it, I mean it sort of depends on what the what the presenting right. issues are but I feel like we do get that like nine to 11 year old sort of mm -hmm. boy that sometimes comes in who was acting out at school and then now is here yeah, on a regular yeah. basis. Yeah. We've had a lot of girls lately. Yeah, um, it's like, so can we have like a box to pick from? Like, okay, it's a school day, mm -hmm. you know, keep keep on that so it's not just a I've had four year like, that's for every single school year. Math, reading. Where are we they find that It's hard for them to focus. Yeah, I mean, yeah it, it is. But some of them are just sitting there watching TV, yeah. doing nothing. And yeah. and I can put it next to the child life stuff if it's more accessible. There. I mean, as far as as far as making it not uh, all the secondary gain from taking a break and right. you know. Right. But wouldn't you do know. any of those kinds of interventions at your direction? This is not something right. we would just right. initiate. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. But could that be so. more a more consistent? <laughs> Part of the plan for for everybody, whether it's the social workers or if they're involved, or with the psych team, you know, can that be something that would be an automatic part of the plan? I think it is hard. I think it's so hard for us not to always have a go-to thing, and yet so many of these kids are so dramatically different, and it is hard because it, it is seem like it's obnoxious behavior, or it's this or that that got them in trouble. But as Gab was saying, I think that so many of them actually have so many other hidden things that what is coming out is that, but what is really causing it is, is kind of what she's referring to. And I think it's kind of really hard to always say, well, if you're here, you should be doing homework. It's no, again, that's not what I mean. But I, you know what I mean by that. It, yeah, sometimes they do just need to sit in a room and, and sit and watch true. TV because but they're apparently. really coming from violent places in their home lives and unsafe areas in these things and I think it's so it's hard to have something which I wish we did but I mean they're idle you know they're just sitting there idly mm -hmm. they're gonna find something to do and it'd be better that they do something productive or something yeah. that we uh, that under our direction then they come up with something like tearing the stuff out of the wall and breaking the drawers right. so, so even knitting needles <laughs> <laughs> <There you go. laughs> 
the wrong one. Yeah. The, I think the, yeah. what you're saying is like, how can we develop more consistent, constructive activities for kids yeah. to do to prevent during, them from right to give them space? Right. Uh, right. Yeah. I think that right. that makes that makes yeah. perfect sense. Yeah, that's you know, right. yeah, yeah, that we need right. constructive activities, and, right. and we haven't standardized constructive activities. It's definitely something that um, when Manny gets back from trial life, yeah. I think we'll we need to another six months a year. Yeah, we'll 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 work with them to we'll work with with her to create those because I know that she's really open to doing that too. Yeah. So um, I want to keep on going, um, you know, push us along. Yeah. Um, our outliers, so here's our outliers in my mind, as sure the list can go, go on. Autistic patients are an outlier. Patients on with prolonged admissions going up beyond three days. Mm -hmm. Children with under that are under five and then patients with developmental delays. I use them as outliers because I feel like these are the kids that we don't do well with. Um, um, we're just not set up. Our interventions aren't set up to help mm -hmm. them, um, and we, we flounder. I feel like we, you know, we do the best that we can. We're looking for How many people. children under five have you seen? We haven't seen a lot, but I feel like every, every you know, every six months, months at, at, yeah. at, I get a call on a Friday night from, you know, from somebody who's, you know, it's like some four-year-old that's blowing out, right? Mm -hmm. So it does happen from time to time, um, but, and, and we always, I mean, I think I've, hospitalized maybe a couple of four-year-olds in my life, um, unfortunately, but um, yeah, if you can. And I was going to ask earlier, people can have psychotic breaks before 13, mm -hmm. yeah. right? That's the <coughs> typical range. Yeah. Yeah. And we, you get more prodromal symptoms, uh -huh. um, and so um, we may be seeing, and we tend to see like a little bits and pieces of, you know, unusual behavior, withdrawal, paranoia, some things that are a little bit harder to to quantify less, uh, probably some more negative symptoms than positive symptoms, but it can occur. Most, uh, m most, I mean, but psychosis in a child is very, very unusual. It really just doesn't um, occur very often. We will usually look for organic causes or, um, or determining whether or not there's actually psychosis going on at all. And some of it is, is, is trauma-based, so even though they might have um, some psychotic features, they, we're not expecting them to have like a full psychotic break later. This is not like a trajectory for schizophrenia or for some kind of schizoaffective disorder. Um, so I brought up three case examples. We've got about 10 minutes. Um, and I, I think that everybody will recognize all of them. Um, um, so um, these are our issues. So, um, and I, I, I want to present all three of them and then we can sort of discuss them in the last eight minutes that we have. So ES, 10-year-old Latino male, brought into the ED for 60 consecutive days on a 5585 hold. Um, medically, he had a colostomy bag. He did not have an anus. Um, at times, he used to throw feces when he was upset. Um, he was in foster care. Mother engaged in patient's treatment in the ED. She happened to work here. The group home did not. Um, and so he continued to return over and over again by uh, breaking windows in his group home van, um, um, by throwing rocks through the windows. He oftentimes would let us know that he'll be back for dinner. Um, <laughs> he did. He would let us know that he was going to be back for dinner, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and um, John, John Muir had refused to take him, and I think that that's the most important thing for us when we're looking at high utilizers of of the service because um, they're not they're, they're not.